So, um, last time we did some kind of historical setup for the discussion today. So last time we talked about this thing that happened in the 90s that was somewhat hyperbolically called the science wars, more or less just a back and forth between people in STEM and people in the humanities. The humanities people were in some sense trying to knock science down a peg or at least scientism, the idea that science is the only legitimate way of gaining knowledge. Uh, and the STEM people responded with at least one hoax paper. We talked about Alan Sokol's hoax paper. We talked a little bit about scientism last time, this idea that science is just the greatest thing ever and also that it's the only way of knowing things and any other way of knowing things isn't a real way of knowing things. Uh, People, just for clarity, people don't identify with scientism typically. It's a term of abuse. It's people accuse you of being into scientism. You don't usually self-identify that way. It would be a bold move to self-identify this way. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about postmodernism. So the, the people from the humanities who were responding to the uh, sort of excessive veneration of science were doing so from the framework of what you might call postmodernism, uh, again, simplified leotards as simplifying to the extreme, I define postmodernism as incredulity towards meta narratives. So it's a general movement, a general kind of skeptical attitude or stance towards the idea that you can fit everything that you need to know into any nice, neat package. Uh, that, put that way, it's pretty tame as a thesis. Uh, I think it's interesting to, if you go back and look at the way people react uh, to postmodern critiques of science, the fear was that not just that you wouldn't be able to put the whole universe into one neat package, but that if you give up on a meta-narrative, all of your little narratives fall apart too. So the worry was, the fear was, that what you end up with is nihilism, not just incredulity toward the idea that you know, here's science and here's religion, here's history and philosophy, and they all kind of stand independently. But if you give up on meta narratives, then you give up on telling any kind of story about the world at all. Uh, very few people seem to have explicitly defended the idea that you can't tell any stories about the world. Uh, I don't know of anybody who actually sort of gives the, that extreme version, but that's what people were worried about. That's what the people reacting to postmodernism we're worried about. Uh, and we talked a little bit last time about social construction. And I've kind of been setting this course up in a way to present sympathetically the idea that science is a social process. And by definition, things that are the product of social processes are social constructions. Now, when the cr critics from the humanities of science called something a social construct, they were trying to, in some sense, denaturalize it, right? So something that seems so obvious, so real, so much a part of reality, if you can show that it's the product of a social process, what you've shown is that maybe it's not inevitable, maybe it could have been otherwise somehow, maybe it's not as real as you thought it was. So uh, this, this trying to show that the products of science aren't just plain objective facts without any history behind them uh, was, I take it, the product of people, or was the, was the aim of people trying to do this style of critique. And the, the slightly terrified reaction was, well, if it's a social construct, that means it's all made up. That means it's not really real. How dare you say science isn't real? I thought you wanted vaccines. Uh, like, you, you use computers. You're not allowed to say it's not real if you use this stuff. So this kind of back and forth had some pretty extreme versions on, uh, people were projecting extreme versions onto the other side of the debate. Um, it's weird to see, I don't know, have you heard the term postmodernism floating around lately? A little bit. It's very weird for me to see that kind of coming back. Uh, from my perspective, somebody who kind of lived through the original version of this and then saw the conversation kind of go away, this seemed like a resolved issue. Uh, and 
it, there's a resolution that a whole bunch of people have developed, which seems to me to be somewhere between the two extreme versions, right? There's nobody around, there's nobody that I know of today being like, science is just all made up. Uh, there's nobody around who says that science is just this undeniably objective, completely ahistorical set of facts. Pretty much everybody's somewhere in between. We figured out pretty well how to get these two, the good parts of these two perspectives to work together. Um, so it's weird to me to see postmodernism being treated now as, as though it's a serious threat in any way. Nihilism is a serious threat. The idea that life doesn't have any meaning or value is a genuine threat. That I think is the thing that might actually extinct us. Like we could solve climate change if we cared hard enough. We just need a reason to care. And the meta narratives used to be the way that, like having a meta narrative used to be the way that we anchored caring about the world. I've got a religion, my religion tells me what's important. Uh, that's how I know what to do. So that kind of went away. But that doesn't mean that you can't care about stuff or that stuff can't be meaningful to you. So there's a real, there's a real threat of nihilism. Uh, people in my circles are calling it the meaning crisis. We have a crisis of trying to figure out how, how to assign meaning to the world. But postmodernism isn't that, as far as I can tell. Uh, so what I propose to do today is to go through what I mean, <clears throat> there's always somebody who's willing to defend any position. So no doubt there are still people out, out there on the fringes defending extreme postmodern relativism and a few people running around defending extreme scientism. Uh, but for the circles I hang out with, I'm going to present to you what's essentially the consensus view these days. I don't, there's a whole bunch of sort of subtle variations on what I'll present, but as far as I can tell, People in the field of thinking about science and how it interacts with society more or less are in some zone that I'm going to describe to you today, which I personally find to be a very satisfying resolution to this apparent tension, right? This apparent tension that we've got between like, look, Grinnell showed us all the ways in which science is in fact a social product. Nonetheless, science seems to produce facts that are more reliable than any other way of producing knowledge that I know of. It certainly produced some startling results. How do we resolve those things? Let me try to, well, try to work through it. So our, our uh, project today is to think hard about what it means for something to be the product of a social process, to be a social construct. So essentially what we're going to do is go through a few different ways of thinking about social constructs, see what their various consequences are, and, and then we'll have a kind of nice framework for thinking about this thing. And I don't think at the end it comes out to be a framework in which we need to be skeptics about the products of science, but it's also not a framework in which we can ignore the kind of social context of science. So you, you, can, hold, you can hold those two things both in your head. You don't have to be a skeptic and you don't have to pretend it doesn't have a social context. Okay, so we'll start from uh, We'll start from the reading from this week. So Haslinger uh, gives us this nice phrase for generic social construction. This is a very broad sense of so in which something might be socially constructed. Uh, it's just in, in case it's an intended or unintended product of a social practice. And as far as I can tell, every, every bit of knowledge, so there's a, sci a life science textbook picture there. As far as I can tell, every bit of knowledge is a social construct in this sense, everything. Math is a social construct, physics is a social construct, philosophy, everything. Uh, truer words I have never seen in a Marvel movie, Thor in Avengers Affinity War says, all words are made up. And that's true. All words are made up. So anything that you use words to express, or symbols, or math, or anything like that, those are all, in this sense, social constructs. Okay, so does that mean that everything that you say with words has no objective truth value? That it's all just purely subjective and you can say whatever you want, and when I say you're wrong, I'm just imposing power on you rather than tracking the truth in the world? Does it? I don't think, I don't think so. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, I don't think that something being a generic social construct means that there's no facts of the matter. 
Uh, so let's, let's uh, get a bit deeper into this. Uh, the fact is all, all words are made up. We experience, in some sense, we experience or express the world through the taxonomies that we build. Right? So a paradigm, a scientific paradigm comes with a kind of taxonomy. Uh, we certainly record our experiences through the ways we have of speaking about the world. Uh, you might notice the, if you take old descriptions of the world, you might notice some oddness of it. Roses are red, violets are blue. Violets, I don't know if you've seen one, are purple, or you might say violet. Uh, why would they call them blue rather than violet? Yeah. It has to do with the cost of pigment during the Middle Ages. So blue dye was very, very expensive. Um, and so they might not have distinguished between, like, like blue and purple would have just been the same vibrant, amazing thing. Like, okay, it's the same thing with... I don't think that's how, I don't, I don't know. Okay. Is, this, is this a well-established explanation or is this, you okay. know, are you speculating? So, no, no, it's not speculative. I, I have a certificate okay. in fine arts. I actually have <laughs> okay. color theory. Okay. okay. So, so the other thing, um, the, the word orange actually originates from the fruit, not the color. Mm. So mm. The, the color, the, the word for the color orange entered the English language because people saw right. oranges and were like, we need a word for this color. Okay. And before that, people didn't distinguish between uh, certain types of color. So it has to do with specialization and the evolution of language where we added words because of increasing complexity of our society. Okay, okay. I think that the rough outlines of that story, I think, are probably correct. I don't know about whether, so do you need to have a pigment for something before you can have a word? A, do you need to have a pigment for a color before you have a word for it? Well, it's... Not in general, been, right? It would have been less necessary. Like, I think the number of words in the English language has increased substantially since like, right. the Middle Ages. Right, right. The basic, the basic story is that they didn't have a word that distinguished purple from blue, right? Okay, next component. Color blindness. So I know. No, 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 no. This is not part of the story. It is. It's it not. Is. It's not. Okay. Color... I know people who can't stop. distinguish stop. between purple and blue. Stop. Blinded. That's stop. not why the word is or isn't in the language. Okay? But... Okay, stop. Stop, please. Okay. Sorry. <sighs> I can tell I've hit a vein of passion that will not ebb for some time. So. Sorry. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. I, li I like your passion, but we gotta, we gotta keep rolling. Sorry. Uh, okay, so uh, similarly, this, if you've ever read your Homer, if you've ever read the Odyssey, they use this phrase over and over again, while sailing over the wine-dark sea. The wine-dark sea. I don't know if you've ever seen the sea. It does not resemble wine in any substantial way. It is not wine-colored. It's dark, dark blue. Right? Uh, but they just didn't have a word to separate blue from purple. Yeah? Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, the categories that we use to describe and explain the world are social constructs. Those constructs change over time. Does that mean that color isn't real? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's. I don't think that's right. Um, but there is something that we could say here. So here's a hotly debated thesis uh, called the Saper Whorf hypothesis. So this is an old hypothesis. There's substantial arguments on both sides of whether this is true, to what extent it's true, in what areas it's true. But it's also called the linguistic relativity hypothesis. So this is the idea that the way that we see color is actually affected by the taxonomies that we bring to bear on it. So you might not, you might not see, if you've got a kind of way of lumping colors together, you might not see color in the same way as somebody who had a different taxonomy for it. So the thesis here is a psychological thesis. It's a thesis about how we perceive the world and how our categories affect the way we perceive the world. Um, so it might be the case that if you've got more color words, you're able to make finer distinctions about colors. Or if you've got different color categories, you might have different ways of lumping color together. Yeah? Have there been any studies on that? Like There's been loads of studies on that. Well, there's evidence on both sides of the debate. Uh, and there's different domains in which it could be true or false. So uh, there's 
like there's studies that show it's true and studies that show it's false. Uh, there's studies about color. There's also studies about time. So different cultures have different ways of talking about time and that might affect how you think about time. That version hasn't really held up all that well. The color thing, maybe. Um, go ahead. Wait, what are you, are no. you thinking of Okay, okay, okay. I I'm could. holding back right now. <laughs> okay, There's so okay. much that I could say right now, <laughs> okay. I'm not going to say it. Okay, okay. Thank you. I appreciate your restraint. We only have so much time. Yeah, right, right. So this is, again, hotly debated. Uh, it's a psychological question, right? So do the categories that you bring to bear on the world change the way that you see the world? In some kind of literal, this is a literal perceptual sense of what you're seeing, what you're experiencing. So this is a way in which, okay, so we started from like very, very generic social construction, like yeah, 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 the words, those are social constructs, that's fine. Now the, the way to kind of ramp this thesis up in sort of seriousness is if you're, the way that your language is structured might have some impact on the way that you see the world. And it's not a, it's not a thesis with nothing behind it in terms of psychology. It's a thesis that is, continues to be debated. It's hard to test. It's hard to test. I mean, we certainly know that people can make color discriminations much more finely than they can name colors. Uh, so you can, you can distinguish like a thousand shades of red, but I, might, I personally have like four words for different colors of red. So I don't, I can, you can tell the much, much smaller differences than you can name. Uh, but it might nonetheless be the case that it has a subtle influence on the way that you perceive the world. So a kind of, a kind of genuine social construction of our experience of reality, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so magenta is all the colors that you can't see. So there are animals that have like more rods and cones in their eyes or more types of rods and cones yep. in their eyes. And so they can actually distinguish like a greater range of colors. Right. So when they're looking at like hot pink, they would see a bunch of colors that we aren't capable of comprehending. Mm. Mm. So there's, there's stuff yep. like that going on as well. Yeah, yeah. There are people with more uh, cones. Uh, so spe especially some, uh, it's much more prevalent in women. So some women can distinguish far more shades of red than other people can. Uh, nobody's quite sure why, um, but there are actual variations. Yeah. It Quick. has to do with hunter-gatherer society. So yeah, this is a thesis that I don't really buy. It's a thesis that I don't really buy. So the women were collecting berries. The thesis is women were responsible for collecting berries and men were out hunting, so women needed finer color gradation. I don't know of any evidence that that's what society was like for humanity for the last 200,000 years. Okay. So these evolutionary psychologists love floating these like, wow, that sounds plausible based on what I know of the Flintstones. Uh, and they don't really back it up with all that much detailed evidence. But anyway, okay, okay. So, uh, okay, so let's take it as read that our language is a social product. Our word for carbon could have been something else. Our word for, our word for carbon is a thing that we made up just like all words. Is carbon itself a social construct? Huh? Is carbon a, not, not really? So carbon in, in quotes is a social construct. The idea of carbon is a social construct, but is carbon? Not, not, that, not in any meaningful sense that I can think of, but people, I mean, so here's where the debate starts. So here's where the actual kind of argument begins. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to draw on uh, Ian Hacking's book, The Social Construction of What? It, is, it ends with a qu question mark. The Social Construction of What? He begins this book with an A to Z list of just, he went through the library catalog and was like, the social construction of A, B, C, D, and there's like dozens and dozens of things that are claimed to be socially constructed. And his project in this book is to try to sort out, well, what do you, how could that possibly be a social construct? What do you mean by that when you say it's a social construct? Uh, so he gives these three conditions, and I think they're pretty good conditions for kind of thinking this stuff through. Uh, so number one, so if X is our thing, we're claiming X is socially constructed. Uh, he thinks that people generally mean the first thing and often the second two things as well. 
One, it need not have existed or need not be at all as it is. X or X as is, it is at present is not determined by the nature of things. It is not inevitable. So carbon doesn't count, right? Carbon totally just has always been the way it is since like the early, early universe. There's nothing that we could do to make carbon something other than it is. We could change its name, so its name is a social construct, but the actual stuff out there is just the way it is. Okay, very often he says they go further and urge that uh, two, the thing is quite bad as it is, and number three, we'd be much better off if X were done away with or at least radically transformed. So this is the kind of motivation for calling something a social construct most of the time. Right? Most people who do the style of critique uh, that they're doing of something saying, you know, this is a social construct. First, they're trying to bring into light that it's something that could have been some other way. So in some sense, denaturalizing it, right? Trying to show that it's not, the, not inevitable. And two, it's probably bad. And three, maybe we should change it. That's the basic structure, he thinks, of a claim that something is socially constructed. And what we just need to be careful about is saying whether the idea of it is socially constructed or whether the thing itself is socially constructed. Okay, so that's a basic framework for thinking about this stuff. Um, my favorite example is, I mean, social construction of gender. And more specifically, my favorite example is Pink is for girls and blue is for boys. And this is my favorite example because when I, when I think about how I feel about this, it seems so natural. It seems utterly inevitable, right? It's just a fact of nature that that's how it is. But let me read this thing out. So this is from uh, Smithsonian Magazine. It says, a June 1918 article from trade publication Earnshaw's Infant Department said, quote, the generally accepted rule is pink for the boys and blue for the girls. The reason is that pink, being a more decided and stronger color, is more suitable for the boy, while blue, which is a more delicate and dainty, is prettier for the girl. So a little over 100 years ago, at least this one magazine, so it's not, there doesn't seem to have been a really strong consensus about it in 1918, but at least these people were happy to say, no, 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 pink is for boys, blue is for girls. Uh, shortly before this, white was for everyone because white is easy to bleach. And if you've interacted with toddlers, that's a very desirable feature for a, for a product to have. Uh, white dresses were absolutely the standard uniform for a European or North American child. Boys and girls, white dresses. That's it. Uh, yeah, so, but as fabric becomes, you know, people start dyeing their fabric, Pink is for boys and blue is for girls. So this satisfies the first condition that hacking lays out, right? It could have been some other way. So again, in my, in my intuitive feeling, because I grew up with this, it's been a fact for my entire life. In my intuitive feelings, I'm like, well, no, it's just so obvious that pink is a girl color and blue is a boy color. And the temptation, if I was an evolutionary psychologist, I would go ahead and come up with some evolutionary story by why it's biologically, that's gotta be the way it is, right? It's just built into our DNA that of course pink is for girls and blue is for boys. Um, but 100 years ago, it was the other way around. So the nice thing about doing this kind of social critique about pointing out that something is a social construction is taking something that's intuitively feels so natural, feels like it's just the way things are, and demonstrating that no, actually it's totally not that way at all. Uh, and there's, gender is a very rich vein for this stuff. If you look at the way other cultures dealt with gender, it's been very different all over the world, all throughout history. So when you say like, no, it's just gotta be this way, well, no, it's, just, it's, not, it's, not inev it's not biologically inevitable that our gender norms are the way they are. They could have been something else. And you know that by looking at the history and seeing that they have been other things in different times and places. So my absolute favorite example of a social construct. Okay. Um, so 
that seems all fine and nice. Why did this stuff worry anybody? And it genuinely did worry people for quite some time. Uh, hacking asks, what, let's get down to gut reactions. What are we afraid of? Plenty. There's the notion that any opinion is as good as any other. If so, won't relativism license anything at all? Okay, so this is the notion of relativism. Uh, relativism is the idea that there's just a bunch of ways of looking at something and no one of them is better or more desirable than any other. I might force my way of seeing things on you, but that doesn't mean that I'm right. That just means I'm more powerful than you. So relativism is a kind of uh, corollary of uh, postmodernism, you might say. So people are relativists about lots of things. You might say, look, it's just a kind of fact about our specific culture that we find certain things right or wrong, right? Like, uh, I had a, I worked with a, a guy who immigrated from Poland and he immigrated when he was a kid. It was a hot day on the playground and he took a shirt off and people's minds were blown. They were just like, you can't do that. Oh my God, you can't do that. What are you doing? He's like, I'm a little kid. I'm hot. I'm going to take my shirt off. That's just the way things are. Uh, so we've got different cultural norms about whether it's okay for a little boy to run around without his shirt off on the playground. Uh, relativism is the idea that not one of, one of those just isn't the correct standard. Yeah? Um, yeah. So this got people worried. And it, I mean, that example is innocuous. Like if we changed the way we acted with respect to that, I don't think anything would, would fall apart. The worry is that if you pull on this one string, the whole sweater comes apart. Uh, that society itself crumbles if you can't, in some sense, say some things are right and some things are wrong. If you have no ability to push back and say, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that, uh, our ability to regulate society seems to be under threat. Yeah? Well, like, okay, so in East Germany, yeah. uh, during the Soviet Union, nudism became fairly popular there. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that potentially, you can, you can build the argument that clothes only exist in our society as a way of establishing social hierarchy. <laughs> that is what nudists say. That and is so, what nudists so say. clothes are just another oppressive aspect of capitalism. I challenge anybody to get through the Canadian winter with that attitude. Okay. Okay, <laughs> um, that's, yeah. uh, that's, <laughs> not, that's not the, reason, the only reason that people wear clothes. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you've ever owned pets and had every surface of your home covered in hair, you might also think that there's some practical utility to having your body covered. Anyway, so this, people were worried about, when they're worried about the critique of calling something a social construct, they're worried about relativism. They're worried about the idea that any opinion is good as any other opinion. Uh, you know, if you're a math teacher and somebody says, yeah, well, that's the way you do arithmetic, but I have my own way and any way of doing it is just as good as any other, you might want some lever to push back on that view and say, no, 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 no. This is the right way to do arithmetic. Your way is wrong. I'm marking your essays, and I'm sorry, I'm not gonna be just like, ah, every essay is exactly, it would be much easier for me if I'm like, every essay is exactly as good as every other. You all get 73. That would be a very straightforward process for me. Um, but that's not what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna apply some standards that I think are good standards uh, I'm going to impose my epistemic authority on you and say, no, no, this stuff is good and this stuff is bad. Uh, that's an anti-relativist position, right? Um, I might not think they're, like, they're not handed down from, from God, but they're still, I'm still not going to be like, yeah, whatever you want, it's all equally good. Yeah. Well, like, the point of getting everybody in the world to convert to the metric system uh, is that then you don't have to worry about converting between right. different systems. Right, but it's not just that. It's that we think, in some sense, it's a better system. It's, it's, it's not just it's not just consensus. It's uh, we like the metric system because it's based on physical constants. Uh, we like it because it's got some nice mathematical properties. So it's there's some objective reasons in some sense. Okay, um, and of course. The worry was not just relativism about some things, like whether it's okay to, for little boys to not wear shirts on the playground. It's a radical relativism. Uh, the idea that everything is just a social construct. Right? So if everything is just a social construct, then everything is up for grabs. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. It's just your perspective, it's just your opinion. Uh, 
This is attributed to, so here's Derrida for beginners. He's represented as a little gremlin man. I mean, this is certainly the way the kind of postmodern critique was experienced by people who were worried about it. Uh, but as far as I can tell, nobody thinks this thing. Nobody thinks that everything is just a social construct, or at least I have never, after, despite substantial reading on this stuff, I've never encountered anybody who seriously endorses that as a view. Yeah. I would, love to, I would love to have examples. I would love to have examples to bag on. Like, that would be great for this lecture to have nice examples of somebody offering this incredibly extreme view and somebody taking them seriously, but I haven't found any. Um, yeah. So, but nonetheless, this is, this is the worry. Um, I think you can present a really quick and easy refutation of this view. So, uh, Hilary Putnam gives this kind of critique. It's a kind of uh, a priori, it's a critique that you can just, just thinking of, think hard about it and you can tell that this isn't right. So the radical relativist says everything is a point of view. But then you can say, okay, well that's your point of view. Mine is that everything is not a point of view, right? So the radical relativist in some sense undermines their own position. You say nobody's right and nobody's wrong. Say, well, okay, well, then you're not right or wrong about that. You can't be right about that if nobody's right or wrong. It's sort of like if somebody says to you, I don't think that language actually works. I don't think we can communicate with each other. You don't have to listen to that person, do you? Because if they're right, then the words that they're saying don't mean anything to you, or they're not connecting you to them in any important way. Right? Somebody says, or just generalized skepticism. I don't have any beliefs. Do you believe that? They can't say yes. Um, so uh, Hillary Putnam offers this kind of the style of critique. You're cutting off the branch that you're for the more most radical forms of skepticism or relativism. You cut off the branch that you're sitting on. You need somewhere to stand in order to critique anything. And if you're like, I don't believe in anything, it's like, cool, we don't have to talk anymore then, right? You just don't, you just, the best move is kind of just to ignore these people. But again, I don't know anybody who's a, that radical of a relativist because this kind of argument, I mean, we kind of make these people up in our heads so that we can argue with them. I don't know of anybody who seriously believes that there's nothing that's true or false. Never met one. Uh, because these, this I take it this type of argument is very compelling. Uh, ancient Greek skeptics didn't think that you don't that it's true that everything is. Uh, you can't believe anything. They thought, if I just adopt a less rigid attitude towards all my beliefs, I'll be happier. That that was the ancient ancient skepticism was, you know, if you didn't believe things so hard, you'd be happier. And that's not the kind of ultra-radical, like, I'm positive that everything's false, or I'm sure that I don't know anything. Anyway. Okay, so let's not worry any further, because A, there are none, and B, they're wrong if there are, about radical relativism, shall we? Let's try to get into where this stuff might actually have some teeth. So, uh, some things from Hacking's list, things that have been called social constructs. Uh, gender and sex, uh, race, women refugees, child TV viewers. Okay, so women refugees, what? Child TV viewers, what? Uh, let's get a little bit into that last one. So I think this is a really interesting case. Um, the social construction of ch children TV viewers. So before this was a category that people kind of explicitly identified, there existed children who watched television. But there wasn't actually ch children's TV shows. There's like three channels, and they're on for eight hours a day or something like that. Uh, there wasn't all that much TV. It, none of it was specifically targeted to children. Yeah? So the category children, child TV viewer was not an important category. It was not a category that anybody talked about or thought about or worked on. 
uh, and certainly wasn't a category of viewer that anybody was targeting. Now, of course, we do have children's programming. We have whole channels dedicated to targeting children. Um, so the category comes into being. Somebody notices, some clever marketer or network person says, oh, you know what? There's a whole bunch of children watching television. Maybe we should try to get their attention. Maybe we should write television programs for children. So the category gets created in this social process. And then the category actually changes the way television's produced and consumed. Because now we've got television shows that are actually targeted towards children. So it's not just a social construct in the kind of bland sense that carbon is. So carbon's a social construct, the word carbon is a social construct. The term child TV viewer is a social construct. But this is a social construct in a much more interesting sense because having constructed the category changes the actual phenomena in the world. Yeah? It changes the thing of interest. So they start writing programs for children. Children start watching those programs. Their tastes change. I don't want to watch your crappy adult TV. I want my, my, I want my children's television that's for me, that targets my interests and viewing habits, that's on in the times that I watch television. So the children themselves start watching television differently. Yeah? Rather than trying to put up with their adults, or with their parents' programs, the children start thinking, I should be watching programs that are for me. So the category, kind of like the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis of network programming, the category changes the thing in the world. Yeah? Uh, so going back to, you might think the same Hacking tells the same basic story about women, women refugees. Yeah? So for a while, it's just, there's just refugees, and people go, oh, there's a subcategory that matters, women refugees. And then people start identifying that category and acting differently towards it. And it changes the way people who are women and refugees experience the world. So the category, in some sense, feeds back into the phenomena it's describing and actually changes the phenomena, yeah? So that's a much richer and more interesting sense of social construction than just the bland, generic social construction of, yeah, all words are made up, yeah? Another thing that's claimed to be socially constructed is quarks. Quarks, of course, are the things that make up protons and neutrons. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make the radical realist assertion that these things were around before we knew they existed. Been quarks for a really long time, uh, before we had a word for them. And then the category of quark is, of course, socially constructed. We could have called it something else. Uh, they, get, they came up with the weirdest names for these things. There's the top quark, bottom quark, charm quark, strange quark. We talk about flavors of quarks. They really didn't need to do that. Uh, I recently watched a, a YouTube video of a lecturer by a British particle physicist, physicist who uh, refused to use the word bottom quark uh, because bottom is in Britain that's very evocative of butts. He didn't want to be the guy who studies the butt quark, so he called it the beautiful quark. So we totally could have called these things something else. The categories and names that we use for them could have been otherwise. That, in that sense, our category is socially constructed. But the quarks didn't notice or care when we found them and started thinking about them. They were utterly unaffected by our categorization of them. Yeah. Yeah. But it's easier to remember the up, down, top, bottom, strange charm. Then, because they could have given it like some Latin word that mm -hmm. nobody knows. Yeah. And that, so like, like I think that is proof of academic elitism. Where you give really complex Greek and Latin words as names to important scientific concepts. Sure, sure. Like, like pe some people have started calling raccoons trash pandas, and that's easier to easier to remember than the Latin word for for a raccoon. That's true. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, all right. So. Um, 
the key thing here, and the thing that distinguishes between uh, those instances of social construction that matter and those that are kind of trivial. So this is Hacking's project. He's trying to separate out versions of calling something socially constructed that really matter and those that are kind of like, yeah, sure, the, core, the, the category quark is socially constructed, but kind of who cares? That's not really an important or helpful observation to make, right? Doesn't get us anywhere in our intellectual projects. Whereas children TV viewers actually does a little bit. So there's, an, so there's some, I mean, not for our purposes, because we're in philosophy of science, but like there are interesting things to say about this category and its effect on the world. It changed the way television programming was done. I'm sure there's somebody in media studies who thinks that's super interesting, worth studying. Yeah. So uh, the important question is about contingency. So contingency here just means that it could have been some other way, could have been otherwise. And quarks really weren't going to be anything but quarks. They don't care what we think of them. They don't care what we call them. They are utterly unaffected by our categorization, by our taxonomies, any of that stuff. So they could not have been otherwise, right? They're just there in the world. And yet all of our access to them is mediated through social processes. Of course, the science that led up to them was, our discovery of them, was a social process that needed to be funded. There were people who were fighting. They had priority disputes. All of that interesting <coughs> history of science led up to us discovering them, but it wasn't going to change the quarks. There was nothing going to be different about them whether we discovered them one way or the other. Whereas the children TV viewers, there probably were a bunch of different ways that could have gone. There probably are different ways that category could have been constructed, and they would have actually affected the way that children's television, the distinction between children and adult television would have worked. Yeah? So the fact that something could have been otherwise seems to be the crucial issue. Um, and now to bring this back to science, here's the question. A civilization fan, I see. OK. So this is the, Excellent. so for our purposes, I love how much joy this brings you. OK, good. Um, here's the question. If you took science back to the beginning and ran it over again, could it have gone differently? This is, uh, if you play the game Civilization, you do, you run through the scientific process. You can run through history, you run through the scientific process. Uh, but it's kind, you're kind of on rails in a sense, yeah? Like it's not like you start civilization over from the beginning and science takes just some completely other path than the one it did. Uh, there's no version of the game where you discover helicopters before trains. There's no version of the game where you discover uh, nuclear physics before bronze working, or whatever it is. Yeah? Uh, so in this game, at least, it's a very linear path. There's no branches. There's no really radically different ways it could have gone. So if, you ran, for, if, if the civilization picture of the universe is true, then if you started science over from the beginning, it would have gone the same way. And if our test for something being interestingly socially constructed is that it could have been some other way, then that means that the large scale structure of science isn't interestingly socially constructed. Now, we probably shouldn't read our ontology off of the structure of video games. It's not really an accurate or reliable way of understanding how the universe works. So I don't take it that this is evidence that science is actually like this. And there might be questions about, you know, it could have been very different in the details, but ended up the same in a large scale. It might be that if we ran science over from the beginning, it would have ended up very different than we, we have now. Uh, so this is, the, this is the, the question, I take it. This is the version of the question that tells us whether, I mean, this is the test, the litmus test, to tell us whether science is a social construct in any interesting or important sense or in the trivial, yeah, we, we made up the word for quarks, who cares since. Yeah? Here's the question. Would science actually have gone different? If you go back from the beginning and started over again, would it have gone different? And 
in the civilization model, of course, you can study writing before you study masonry. Uh, so you can have different priorities. You can certainly imagine us working harder on, say, medicine or biology before we worked hard on physics. That doesn't mean that we would have come up with different answers in physics or biology, right? So like, do we eventually come up with a theory of, of evolution by natural selection, no matter how history went? And if we do, then it's a social construct, but not in any important or interesting sense. Because the point of identifying something as a social construct is to point out that it could have been some other way, in a way that matters. And people are especially motivated to do that when it's a social construct that's bad for people and that maybe we should change it. So this stability versus contingency thing is, seems to me the really important question here. Uh, so uh, just to put in some more philosophical jargon here, uh, what we're interested in is maybe nominalism. So nominalism is the idea that our categories are kind of just made up and that we could have built our categories quite differently. So a natural kind is a category that we more discover than construct. So the category of, for example, carbon, most people, a lot of people think that's a natural kind, right? We didn't just arbitrarily chop up the elements. We actually discovered the important natural categories, the categories that actually exist in the world. And if some other species on a distant planet did physics, did chemistry, they would eventually come, they'd have different words for it, but they'd have the same categories as we do. Now, are races like that? I'm gonna go with no. White people, or Irish people didn't used to be white. Like a hundred years ago, Irish people didn't count as white. Italians didn't count as white. Now, white has always been, you must be this white to play. It's always been a category that was used as a technique for excluding people. So as, as different ethnicities get into the group, they become white. Um, there's no, as far as anybody can tell by looking at the kind of distribution of genes, there's no natural cutting points in the way there is in the periodic table. Uh, we have terms, but those terms don't map onto like really clear natural categories in the world. Uh, we could argue about that, but that's, that's, that's the kind of consensus amongst population geneticists. None of us want to get expelled. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's more that none of you should be incorrect about this. Uh, uh, here's another one, here's a fun one. Mental illnesses. Uh, every little while they produce a new taxonomy of mental illnesses. Uh, and the hope is, the dream is, of course, that we find the natural kinds. That we categorize them in a way that, the expression is, carves nature at its joints that finds the natural cat, that discovers the natural categories that exist in the world, which hopefully comes along with categories of treatment that are effective for those categories of illness. Right, that's the, that's the dream. Anybody gonna bet that we're there yet? No, well, probably not, probably not. Probably something like bipolar is a bunch of different things, that depression and schizophrenia are a bunch of different things uh, that we kind of lump together by their symptoms. Um, that's, if, I was, if I had to bet, that's what I'd bet on. I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist, but if I had to bet, I would say that we don't have natural categories or natural kinds in the diagnosis of mental illness. We want them, we're looking for them, we're working on it. It's not like people don't care about that, but we don't have them yet. Yeah. Okay, so, so let's say uh, viral diseases. Yep. You have clear categories there because you have a specific virus that causes a particular sure. viral disease. Sure. So, so there, in that situation, is that you've got clear natural categories? Um, 
You have, you probably have pretty good categories. I doubt that you have perfect natural kinds because of the mutation rate in viruses. Uh, viruses are infamous for being really good at mutating. So recently, the, 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 latest, the latest update from Science News on the coronavirus is, turns out it's two viruses. Hooray. Well, mutated. Yeah. So, so it was one virus, now it's two viruses. Right. So the question is, is that, one, is that two versions of the same virus, or is it two different kinds of thing? And if there's an objective answer to that question, then it's a natural kind. If there's not an objective answer, if it's just sort of convenience that we use, then not so much. That's the, those are the kind of stakes of the debate. Uh, species are supposed to be natural kinds. Those are kind of our paradigm natural kinds. Turns out species are super hard to define. Uh, any biologists in the room? What's, what's the, what do they tell you about species? So uh, here's a very standard definition of species. If two uh, organisms can mate and produce fertile offspring, then they are the same species. Um, yeah? Uh, grizzly bears and polar bears can mate and produce right. fertile offspring. Yep. They're called growler bears. Growler bears. There's also koi wolves. So in urban areas, there's, there's a great David Suzuki documentary about this. Uh, dogs, wolves, and coyotes have mated and produced fertile offspring that are a blend of all three. And they run around urban, they're specialists in running around urban areas. So those were supposed to be three separate species. Turns out they can mate and produce. Also, that definition doesn't work at all for the vast majority of living things that don't sexually reproduce. Like almost all of the bacteria and the plants, right? So it's not a great, I mean, we don't, the, the answer is we don't have a good clear definition of what a species is. Just a, it's just a, a matter of debate. So species don't look really much like natural kinds, which should, going back to the race thing, make you very pessimistic that subdivisions within a species are gonna be natural kinds. Anyway, okay, so, Hacking's getting at this point that, uh, so yeah, okay, everything is socially constructed in some, some sense, but some things are stable and non-contingent, and some things are like very highly contingent, right? Like carbon is really a super stable category. You're not gonna get much more stable than that, right? Something is carbon or it isn't, we kind of discovered the category of carbon. Uh, you can be wrong about its nature. You can be right about its nature. So yes, we made up the name for it, but no, it's really not gonna turn out to be something that, oh yeah, well, if just in 1840, if this scientist rather than that scientist had gotten the funding and prestige, then we'd turn out that carbon actually is a totally different thing. Like that's just not, in, it's not, as far as anybody can tell, not in the cards for the history of how things would have gone. Um, yeah. So he lays out, I'll just kind of zoom through this, but he lays out six grades of social construction, the sort of seriousness of how socially constructed it is. Uh, kind of going, the top is the least serious, down to the bottom, which is the most serious. Uh, so I'll go through these kind of one at a time um, and describe how some of, some of these matter quite a lot and some of them kind of don't matter. And what, what's important when you're talking about what something being socially constructed is, what level are you talking about? There's that weird sound again. Okay. So, historical. Probably the lowest grade of social construction. Uh, something is a social construct in this sense if it's the product of a historical process. This is like Haslinger's generic social construction. So take, for example, the Pythagorean theorem. It's a lovely little theorem. Uh, you use it to calculate the length of a hypotenuse of a triangle, right? Um, so, and here it is from about 1000 AD in ancient Chinese. And it's the same theorem and as far as anybody can tell, is developed independently. 
Yeah? There wasn't going to be a different answer that people came up with for the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle. There, there, just, there just was. Unless you're on a curved surface. If, you live in, if you're living in highly curved space, maybe you get a different answer to this. But given a plane surface, the fact that Pythagoras and these ancient Chinese mathematicians and maybe ancient Babylonian mathematicians as well all independently produced the same theorem isn't super surprising because there just wasn't going to be a different answer to that. It was just a right and wrong answer, right? So, uh, yes, there's, hist there's history here. We call it the Pythagorean theorem. We could have called it something else. Uh, we have different experiences of what math means to us. So the ancient, for the ancient Babylonians, math is like glowing with religious significance. It's the language of the gods. Right? So for them, studying mathematics and for the ancient Greeks who kind of take over this tradition from the Babylonians to the Egyptians to the Greeks, math has got this kind of religious quality to it. Uh, ancient Chinese mathematicians really didn't think of it that way. They're like, cool, this is super handy, super useful for doing stuff. That's kind of the beginning, middle, and end of it for them. Um, so they didn't, they didn't have the same experience of what math meant. But that's the same theorem. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's a so in this histor uh, well, our sh our shapes. I mean, okay. So uh, something is a social. This is the weakest version. Something is a social construct if it's the product of a historical process. I mean, it so. Actually, the actual carbon that's like in asteroids isn't a historical process in the sense that humans were involved. So it's not a social construct. Society wasn't involved. Uh, there are spheres and triangles in the universe that society had nothing to do with producing. Those are not social constructs. Even in this weakest sense, those are not social constructs. So it has to be, society has to be somehow involved in it, bringing it about. Now our names for them are social constructs. But the actual like triangles and spheres in the universe that we had nothing to do with producing, no, nah, that's not a social construct at all. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, because there's hex there's hexagons in the atmosphere of Saturn, on the poles of Saturn, it produces this cool like massive hexagon. Uh, so there you go. There's a hexagon that nobody was involved in creating, as far as anybody can tell. So, so yeah, yeah. How about that? Um, I did a project on Saturn uh, mm. in high school, and it was, oh, I mean, it was an art thing. I had to do a sculpture of it, and I found out about that high school thing, and I wanted to make it on the Saturn model. Mm. My teacher was like, oh, but what about, what, what's the, the other meaningful significance? Oh, it's it's hexagon, it's a six-sided thing. And like, she went on a tangent about these things, and I'm like, whoa, this, this shape. Just exists in the exists. world, it's yeah. It's not anything yeah. No. Nothing involved with this. Not for the one on Saturn. No, yeah, well, obviously not. And I did it because I, I thought, I, well, I love Saturn. And she didn't teach me how to speak English. <laughs> 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 okay. And I'm like, no. <laughs> okay, okay. But yeah. Okay, real quick. Okay, so because humans have the ability to recognize, like, a face, uh -huh. like, just smiley face, that would show that, like, the concept of a circle is, like, hardwired into the human brain mm -hmm. to begin with. Okay. So the shape... Just the concept of the shape is not a, it's not a social construct. It was there to begin with. Uh, okay, I accept that. Okay. And you had a you had a comment. No. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So um, there's stuff. We, uh, here's a, the next grade of social construction. Something is an ironic social construct in this sense. Uh, it's a product of a historical process, but we have to pretend that it's not. Uh, money's like this. So. Uh, the system of currency we have today is absolutely the product of a social process. It could have been other ways. Uh, it used to be other ways. So money used to be pegged to gold, for example. So if you had a bill, it represent, pardon me, it represented a chunk of gold somewhere. That's what it was there for. Like this bill represents gold, and it doesn't anymore. Uh, so the way that money works has changed over time, changed dramatically. Um, but 
go ahead and try to pretend that money's a, like, go ahead and act like money's just a social construct, see where that gets you, it will go very poorly for you. You have to, you have to act as though this thing is an objectively real fact about the world. I mean, money imposes itself on us in a very real way that even if you're fully aware of the history of money, it doesn't really change the way you get to act with respect to it. So that's going to contrast with the next couple of grades of social construction. Yeah? I mean, maybe if you do a revolution, you get to change the way you act with respect to money. But none of us are doing that today. Today, we have to like treat this as just a fact of the world. right? Uh, that contrasts with the reformist and the unmasking versions of this. So reformist notion of social construction is X is bad, and although we can't get rid of it altogether, we can change it. So we, we should recognize that something is a social construct so that we can alter it. Uh, picture of the women's suffrage, suffragettes here. Uh, suffragettes were not, they were not uh, radical, like destroy gender people, they were like, okay, gender, maybe we should both vote. That was their proposal. They're like It was just like, hey, let's all vote. Uh, it was not destroy gender, it was, we need to update the picture of gender that we have in a legal sense such that we're all voting, right? So, but at the time, I'm sure for a lot of people, it was just blindingly obvious. It's a very nice phrase, isn't it? blindingly obvious. It was blindingly obvious that women don't vote. Right? It was just utterly natural. It was utterly like transparent to them. That's just the way it is. You don't, you don't vote. Men vote. Uh, so the reformist social construct constructivist says, hey, have you ever noticed how that's not the only way things could be? And maybe we should change it a bit. That's the reformist sort of picture. Uh, it's important to notice that X is socially constructed so that we can make changes to it. Uh, and that goes really nicely with the unmasking. So unmasking says X could have been otherwise and by demonstrating that we in some sense reduce the authority or the naturalness of it. So pink is for girls, blue is for boys, as I said, is my favorite example of this. It strikes me to this day, I, I've used this example a number of times, I'm perfectly aware that it's a social construct. It still strikes me as supernatural, what, not, not supernatural, it's su very natural that these, these colors go with those genders. Uh, we might say, to use the language that we introduced before, unmasking makes an unknown known into a known known. Something that you were just assuming before without even reflecting on it, turning it into an explicit object of knowledge so that you can critique it. So that goes really nicely with the reformist version of social construction where we're like, this sucks and we need to change it. So you say first, hey, did you notice that it doesn't have to be this way? Second, did you notice that it sucks? And maybe we can change it. Okay. Uh, and then deeper and deeper, we get to the rebellious stage. Look, X is contingent. It's bad, and furthermore, we'd be better off if it was done away, if it was done away with entirely. Uh, so this is not just reforming the concept, but getting rid of it. There are lots of people who think this is about gender. Like, look, gender is just a mistake. We just get rid of it. Um, there's lots of people who think this about beauty ideals, for example. Look, this stuff was just a mistake. Just get rid of it. Um, and then one more stage, which is almost identical to rebellious, but just includes a more practical aspect, the revolutionary. So same as rebellious, but there's actually, a, instead of just pointing this out, they have a concrete plan to get rid of the thing. So the monarchy is a nice example. Uh, in the French Revolution, they said, hey, did anybody ever notice that this idea that there are natural, divinely ordained leaders is all made up, and furthermore, it's bad, and furthermore, I have an ax, so let's go chop some heads off uh, and solve this thing. So it's, they're, not just, they're not just 
pointing it out and they're not just saying it should be done away with, they're actually kind of doing practical things to get rid of it. Uh, yeah. Guillotining people. Yeah. So this thing might be more about technology than science. Ooh, well, a lot of, so all of this has been quite general. This has been quite, quite general. The gender stuff wasn't about science either. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so hacking sixth grades are supposed to apply to anything that you're calling a social construct. You're supposed to be able to locate that thing somewhere in that list. Because those, those like rebellious concepts would have already, would have existed through most periods in human history, but it was the fact that gunpowder was invented and you could, the, the peasants could quickly arm themselves with guns Whereas before, it took way more effort to train an army to rebel. Sure, sure. That's a, it's certainly a historical factor. Yeah. Okay. So, hacking six grades, six grades of the kind of seriousness with which you're calling something a social construct. From the pretty much trivial to the we're out in the streets with barricades, les, les miserabling it. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, and I'd like to give you, okay, so we started off with this like historical, like this conflict in the 90s of like, oh my God, people are saying science is all made up. And oh my God, these people are saying that science is just the bee's knees and is all you need. Uh, and part of the solution to that was people doing some careful thinking about what the claims being made on both sides were. I take it that that's what hacking was doing. He's just trying to categorize, like what exact, tell me exactly what do you mean when you call something a social construct and why are you doing it? So with that in place, it's easy to kind of like, it helps a lot to sort of resolve the different perspectives to have, to have a place for the different ways of thinking about this stuff. Uh, it's not yet a positive vision of what we should think. Uh, so let me just briefly do one version of, I think, where the consensus broadly is in the, at least the people I hang out with. Uh, again, there's, there's a bunch of different versions of this, but here's one version that I really like. It comes with a really nice metaphor. So Rasmus Winther, uh, he's, I've been giving this lecture for like five years while he's been trying to write and publish this book. I think it's coming out in the next two months. So very soon you'll be able to buy this book by, by Rasmus. Uh, called When Maps Become the World. And he's arguing basically, I mean, his basic thesis is realism versus relativism is an essentially misguided argument. Uh, there's something in between that's better than either of them. Don't fight, you guys. Believe my thing. And he uses the example of map making to argue for a perspective he calls contextual objectivity. So he thinks that there's objective facts, but they happen within a framework. That's the basic idea. Okay, so let's do the, let's do the example. So, uh, I hope you've seen this before. This is called the Mercator projection. The Mercator projection is a way of taking uh, a very information rich structure, which is a 3D globe, and mapping it onto a 2D surface. So you're always gonna lose a bit of information. When you take something in 3D, map it onto 2D, you're gonna lose some information. Uh, there's a, but there's a, and there's a, very, a variety of ways of mapping the globe onto a 2D structure. So the Mercator projection was very, very popular, especially amongst people who uh, sail boats, because on the Mercator projection, if you're trying to sail from England to Newfoundland, a straight line on the map is a straight line for your boat. Yeah? So... If your concern is, I need to sail my ship, then having this way of projecting the globe is ideal for you, because you want to take a straight line, the shortest distance between any two points. The shortest distance on a globe corresponds to the shortest distance on this map. That's nice for you. Uh, it has some weird features, though. So, for example, uh, Greenland is enormous. It's about the size of Africa. It's bigger than South America. But that's not true. So here's another way of projecting the globe onto a 2D surface that actually preserves land mass. Africa is really big. 
Greenland is really, really small relative to any of the other continents. So you can't take a, if you take a straight line on this map, the straight line is not the straight, a, a, a straight line on the globe is not a straight line on this map. So it's not, not much good for, for example, sailing a ship. If you want to sail a ship, you use the Mercator projection. But if you want to know how big things are, you want to use this, the Berman projection. Yeah? And you might come up with some weirdly distorted ideas about the world if all you've ever seen, I mean, I take it this is, you're much more likely to have seen the Mercator projection. And if, for example, you're a Canadian, you're like, wow, Canadian, Canada is huge. Look how big we are. We're, big, we're as big as Australia. Look how big Greenland is. It's way bigger than Australia. Uh, you might come up with some distorted ideas about the structure of the world if all you've ever seen is the Mercator projection. Uh, so this one gives you much better information. Okay, so which of those two is correct? Yeah, they both are. They both are. They both are. Or neither of them. I, either would, yeah. 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 The globe is correct. Right, right. So, so that's the correct model. Well... If neither of these are correct, then I don't think the globe is correct either, because the globe is also a way of taking a huge amount of information and reducing it, right? So does your globe include the height of things? Does your globe include the fact that the Earth is not in fact a sphere, it's an oblate spheroid with a bunch of bumps on it? No? Okay, then it's not correct. It's a way of taking a very high information structure and projecting it onto a lower information structure, right? So these are both, in some sense, I want to say, like, oh, if you're talking about things that are true or false, there's actually only one type of thing in the universe that can be true or false. It's a sentence, a proposition, if you want to be philosophical about it. Nothing else. Uh, what these two projections are, are methods of representing the world. Now, they can be right or wrong. I mean, if you, if you say, okay, I'm going to do a Mercator projection, and your Australia comes out bigger than North America, then you did it wrong, right? So there's facts of the matter here. But the question, which of these projections should we prefer, actually depends on what you care about. If I'm driving a boat, I want the Mercator projection. If I'm trying to figure out how big things are, I want the Berman projection. So we've got, in either of these cases, when you're mapping anything, when you're building a map of the world, you're doing a selection process, always, right? Uh, there's the, the famous uh, story by Borges where people want to make a map that's super accurate, so they make it exactly the same size as the kingdom that they're mapping. The whole, the map just lays over the entire kingdom. That's not a map, right? That's just an extremely inconvenient piece of paper. The function of a map is to take something complex and represent it in a simple way. You're always losing information when you do that. You're always doing the selection process. And there's not a correct answer to what to select or how to select it. There are some aspects that we emphasize and some that we downplay. And which aspects should be emphasized and which can be downplayed depends on what you care about, right? That depends on your values, what's important to you. Yeah? But once you've decided what's important, once you've decided which projection you're going to use, then you can be right or wrong. Yeah? So uh, here's a bike map of Peterborough. Uh, this is different than Google Maps, it's different than a driving map. The bike map shows the bike paths. Uh, if you're a cyclist, you want to know where the bike paths are. That's a fact that's picked out and emphasized by this map. So it's represented very clearly for us, because if you're a biker, that's what you want to know about. Now, having made that choice, like, you can be wrong about where the bike paths are. 
if you have this bike path going down this way, but it actually goes down this way, you're wrong. Yeah? So within, within the framework that you've chosen, there are right and wrong answers. It's not relativism. So inside the framework, we're not doing relativism anymore. We're not doing, oh, just whatever you think. Yeah? You can be right. You can be wrong. There are facts. And those facts are independent of our interests now. The question is, which framework, which way of representing the world do we want? Now that's a question of values, right? What type of map do you want? That's a values question. Within a type of map, are you right or wrong? That's an objective question. Yeah? If you draw the bike path in the wrong spot, doesn't that also mean that you're wrong outside of the framework as well? Well, what counts as right or wrong is determined by the framework. Yeah? Okay. So, um, that's, ba that's a basic idea of contextual objectivity. Uh, that is, that there are going to be various you know, value-based choices to make that are not true or false questions about how we're going to represent the world, the framework in which we're going to represent it. And then once you've got a framework, then there are true or false questions, not just good or bad, useful or not useful. Then there are, is this a correct uh, implementation of that framework or isn't it? Uh, I think this can interestingly relate back to our discussion of the problem of noticing and having a frame for a given problem. So remember that stuff about framing your problems, about insight problems where you have to change your frame. Uh, a given framework or a given paradigm, Winther wants to say, isn't the kind of thing that can be right or wrong, right? Because it's a, a set of choices about what, what you care about in some sense. Yeah? Um, but they can, they can nonetheless encode values. So by caring about some set of things more than another set of things, you are making, you, there are values there. So Winter's proposal, contextual objectivity, is trying to find some place where we can say two things. We can hold two ideas in our head at once. We can say, yes, values play a role in the way that we represent the world. If you're picking a projection, that's a values proposition. Do you care about driving a boat or do you care about getting land masses right? Values play a role in constructing our view of the world. Can you be right or wrong about the world? Yes, because once you've chosen your framework, there are facts of the matter about whether your map fits reality. Yeah? You can build any kind of map you want. The kind of map that you want depends on what you care about. But having chosen a kind of map, now you can be right or wrong. You can be right or wrong. And that's, what, that's what the exact opposite of the radical relativist position. Something like that. So the globe at no point boils down to any given 2D map. There's not just one correct map. The relativist had that bit right, that there's lots of ways of looking at the world and that your values are going to help determine which ways you think are important or interesting. But important and interesting are different than right and wrong. And it's within a way of mapping the world that you get the right and wrong, the correct or incorrect, the objectivity that we're talking about. This is the proposal. Yeah. What about like flat versus like, <laughs> like These are all. I believe like the world, like the world is flat, and then I choose to map the world like that. Is that then? Yeah. Correct because my framework is that both always flat. So the world is flat is a is a proposition. It's a sentence. It's a it's true. It's provably true or false. So that's a good. It's a good point though. So, so it might be. It might be the case that. Not all frameworks are like even feasible or something like that. Uh, that's a flat Earth picture. It's a flat. It's flat. It's the Earth. No, no. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know what I know what she means. I know. What she means. Yeah, yeah. So uh, good. That's actually a very interesting. That's a very interesting thought here. So like, um, 
we might not be purely, you might want to say, you want to sprinkle in even a little more objectivity than that and say something like, look, not all your frameworks are going to be worth, worth a piss. Like, you, not all your frameworks are going to be such that you can be like, yeah, well, whatever you think. Uh, or just, or it's just a matter of your values. Um, I don't know, like, yeah, so you, you, you do need some kind of baseline, like, yes, this framework is at least mildly plausible, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe it's useful to look at when the framework first emerged. So like going back to the concept of like a tech tree. Yep. Yep. So like technological advancement in humans probably began with like stone tools. Yeah. And so being able to distinguish between a more advanced stone tool and a less advanced stone tool would have like a distinct evolutionary advantage. And so like all, all of our understanding of technology is built on just understanding whether this rock is better or worse than this rock. Mm. Potentially, yes, thank Potentially. you. Potentially, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, I don't know. So this is, again, this is Winter's way of, of finding some middle ground between the kind of like people insisting that science is a social construct and the people who insist that it nonetheless comes up with objective facts. Um, you might want to say something like there are some more natural frameworks. Uh, so like there's some, just like with, so hacking's thing was, there are some categories that we more discover than make up. So you could have a totally different framework for carving up the periodic table of elements, but boy, some of them are bad and some of them are really, really good. Uh, some of them are more natural in some important sense. So maybe hacking or maybe uh, Winther's thing applies more to stuff where there is choice. So within those, within those non-natural categories, within those places where there are some choices to be made. So these two projections, there's genuine choices to be made. There's nothing inevitable about the Mercator projection. There's nothing inevitable about the Berman projection, right? There's a genuine choice that we have to make. The choice is value-based. With, with the periodic table of elements, maybe there is no choice there. Maybe there's just some people get it, you, sometimes you get it right and sometimes you get it wrong. This is a way of talking and thinking about those, those situations in which there are genuine choices. There are genuine sort of like questions that you can go one way or the other on. Uh, and that might apply to scientific paradigms as well. So a scientific paradigm is a set of beliefs about what's interesting or important in a scenario. Sometimes there might just be a fact of the matter about what matters. Sometimes it might not be the case. Sometimes there might be a whole bunch of stuff that we could be interested in. So again, I think particularly about mental illness. So there's currently a very bio, like microbiological picture of mental illness. What we want to know about a mental illness is which neuroreceptors are involved uh, which neurotransmitters are, are working on those and how can we alter those with drugs? Like that's one, that's certainly one slice of the picture. Uh, here's a different slice that you could take. Which ways of organizing society bring about these symptoms and which other ways of organizing society would alleviate them? A very different question. Yeah, so like uh, which lifestyles are prone to bringing about problems and which lifestyles alleviate them. Very different question than the kind of biomedical question. And it might not be that one of them is just the only correct question to be asking. So now our values are, ha are playing a role in deciding which questions we're asking. Within the biomedical paradigm, there are facts of the matter, like you know, serotonin and dopamine play a real role in mental health. So I think that's just a fact, right? but it's a fact within a values-driven paradigm, right? The value, the things that we care about as a society make that the question that we're asking, and then having asked the question, there are right and wrong answers. You don't, having asked the question, you don't get to be like, oh, it's just whatever you think. It's just all relative, man, right? Uh, but the quest, which question you're asking might be a matter of what you care about or are interested in. Who are you impersonating there? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Some, I don't know. I guess that's what Derrida sounds like. I have no idea. All right. Okay. So, I don't know. I don't know. You don't have to. You don't have to buy any or all of that. 
from where I'm standing, having sort of seen the rise and fall of this argument, this middle ground seems to have taken the consensus, the, sta the status of a consensus, such that we don't really worry too much about it anymore. Uh, this is not a thing that people are too exercised, at least within my discipline, this is not a thing that people get too worked up about. So, okay, that's probably enough for today. Uh, next week we'll start talking about something much less interesting, which is scientific explanation. We'll do some real technical philosophy next time. All right, thanks everyone.